Hello and welcome to another edition of the Knicks Film School pregame show. My name is Andrew Claudio, a.k.a. GMAC, and it's time to preview another Knicks matchup, this time on Tuesday night against the Chicago Bulls. And the way I'm going to preview that matchup is by referring to a pod I did four days ago. If you missed the show that I did on Friday morning with Will Gottlieb of the CHGO podcast, uh, CHGO Bulls. Uh, it's the CHGO Network. They have all the Chicago sports teams covered over there at that network. They do a great job. And Will came on and previewed the Friday night matchup against the Bulls. And guess what? Not much has changed except one game for the Knicks. So not much is going to be different. So it hasn't aged at all. If you want a full Bulls preview, please go check out that episode. It's a great conversation. We even get into some of the Bulls history. Uh, if you want to go through his Mount Rushmore rival. So check that out. It's available wherever your podcast feeds are. And of course, right here on the Knicks Film School YouTube channel. Uh, instead of previewing the Bulls again, I decided to reach out to my good friend from Bleacher Report and also the host of the Hardwood Knox podcast, Mr. Dan Favalli. Uh, we had about a 90 minute conversation and split it into two parts. This is part one. The second part will be available on the Hardwood Knox podcast feed. Uh, we we get into all the different things going on in the Knicks world right now from a national perspective. And as a guy that covers all 30 teams, I really think you're going to enjoy what he has to say about Jalen Brunson and where he should place in the MVP conversation. So here's part one of two. Please go subscribe to Dan's channel, to Dan's uh, show, to, to all the different places. Support the people that make time for us. Here is part one of two of my conversation with Dan from Valley of Bleach Report and the Hardwood Knox podcast. Enjoy. My good friend uh, and colleague in the industry that little, little did you know, Nick fans grew up a Knicks fan and then he had his heart uh, ripped out and he had to sell it to journalism and now he has to be objective. But Mr. Dan Favalli, welcome back to the Knicks Film School podcast, sir. Oh man, calling me a journalist right off the bat. That's unfortunate. Uh, I know. Thank you for that splendid introduction. As always, though, but that's a yeah. look. I told you that's why Knicks fan criticism cuts deeper than any other fan base where they think that I have a bias against the Knicks. And it's like, well, I do, but it's, it's not what you're claiming that I do. Listen, we get it. You like the national media hate the Knicks. That's just the thing that that is yeah, a narrative that is, true. A, is a C option at best, right? He needs <laughs> to be a third option on the champ. What, is, what was that discourse? I already forgot. Yes, about what he's not a one or a one A. He's a two or maybe a two B. And what he definitely isn't is in the top 10 of an MVP ladder, whatever that means. Um, he's Dan definitely goes, in the top if it's in a top 400 of the MVP ladder. In my, I appreciate in my that. A lot of rungs on that ladder. It's a really tall ladder, but Jalen Brunson is somewhere on that ladder. Dan, it's always great to talk NBA with you and knowing your your Knicks uh not bias like your your Knicks um oh, it's, a, it's a bias your preference like you 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 like the Knicks you're around Knicks fans a ton um we text all the time uh I do want to open the floor to start here because like I said the Knicks are coming off this win on Sunday against the Milwaukee Bucks and the vibes are back to the conference finals we go JJ Reddick's talking about it uh every Super Chatter on Sunday night was talking about it. Uh, in your opinion, uh, well, maybe I'll just get your opinion of the Knicks because we haven't talked since uh, since November when this team looked a lot different. Uh, your thoughts on the Knicks and and how this season has gone and their potential ceiling for the playoffs? Yeah, they've exceeded expectations in the sense that if you said this is all the stuff that happened this year and they might finish with the second best record in the Eastern Conference, those two things don't really seem to connect to each other. And so um, the way they've been, especially, you know, since the all-star break defensively, um, the stuff, the the thing I was most wrong about, even though I like the signing Dante DiVincenzo turning into one of the best high volume three point shooters alive, just like uh, absolutely mind melting. They have floored me. And I think it speaks. We were having this discussion on hardware Knox the other day when we thought that after Julius Randle was shut down for the season or the shoulder injury was re-aggravated or they determined he needed surgery, we were just convinced that OG Ananobi wasn't going to come back. And then he comes back that same week because this is the Knicks and that's how that stuff works. Is we were talking, it's a testament to like when you get to the playoffs, you want as bad as Julius Randle has been in the playoffs, and Julius Randle has been very bad in the playoffs, to have a second shot creator to just as an idea to alleviate the pressure off of Jalen Brunson, to force defenses to get into rotation where they can't just game plan around Jalen Brunson. It's huge. And yet we were talking about the Knicks like, yeah, it's going to be harder without Julius Randle. We don't know if OG Ananobi's coming back. But like we could see a scenario where they, they make it to the conference finals and maybe come out of the East. And I think that's the, 
the biggest testament to the body of work that they've put together this season. And it's there, there are concerns to have. And it's just, you know, I think people, have, some people outside the New York media have harped on, well, like they've gotten a little bit lucky with health. And it's like, no, they're just playing hurt. And it's so like, that's what they're like, what Isaiah Hartenstein is doing. And he's just going to dive on the floor. And there's, does he still has that Achilles thing in the rear view? And it's like Josh Hart and Deuce McBride are lo- logging just obscene amounts of minutes at this point. Jalen Brunson is out for like a beat and then just coming back and resumes all NBA level play. This team is special. And there's like a, this is not scientific or functional at all, but there's just like a synergy to them both on and off the court to where you believe that Tibbs's whole next man up strategy and what he's always been able to do to, to, you know, grab the most out of his rosters. This feels like something different. Even, even knowing that Julius Randall, who's again, such a central pivotal piece to how you want to operate on offense. Even without him there, I think you look at this team and say, yeah, they're a threat to Boston. We know it, but like when you're talking about the second best team in the East, there's the element of, well, why isn't it the Knicks? Tell me why it's not the Knicks. Yeah. There's a, there's a lot to, to react to there. So let me go through point by point. The first thing about Julius Randall, it being like, it's such a weird point to make because I agree with you. Like it's, it's going to be difficult for them to create offense because of the hub that he could be in the playoffs, but because of how bad he's been in the playoffs, it's weird to have the take. Oh, they can't win in the playoffs without Julius Randall. Like, no, that seems to have been the problem in the past that whenever Julius Randall's on the court in the playoffs, it holds them back. Um, I do think that their ceiling is, is somewhat capped. Um, and it's, it's really a Boston ceiling. Like, I just don't think they could be Boston. It's, it's really just my, my sole take is that I think they can face Boston. Potentially it depends on where their seating ends up, but, uh, I don't, I, I want to see it. How's that? I'd love to get a seven game series where this team is healthy, that team's healthy. And we see what happens in a conference finals. The, the funny thing about what this season has been, been and to your point about how like they're playing hurt i was saying this uh on the regular nick's film school pod because we had the is this season from jalen brunson better than carmelo anthony any carmelo anthony season conversation and i was ready to say yes it is uh i don't remember the last time the knicks weren't playing shorthanded you know it's like after julius randall went out because og and obi went out the exact same game And it was like they had three games where Ananobi came back and then he went out. And they've, like, I've seen Charlie Brown minutes and Daquan Jeffries minutes and Alec Burks minutes. My God. Um, (laughs) And it's like I get these seven minute, seven seven man rotation games and sometimes six man rotation games and Precious Situa at the four. And they're still like within striking distance of the two seed. And it's like you said, a testament to what what Tibbs has done this year. It's a testament to that that year I'm alluding to with Jalen Brunson and what he's done this season. And it's why I'm curious when we talk about the MVP where you'll potentially put him. But it also says something about the East that all these other teams, like shout out to Ty Windish, because he came on here on Saturday. We were talking about the Cavs, and he's like, something stinks in Cleveland. And I do agree. Something stinks in Cleveland. And then I watched the Bucks on Saturday. Something stinks in Milwaukee, Tampa Valley. So uh, the fact that the Knicks are the one team that's pretty much taken all these blows and been able to kind of survive uh, it is, is why we've just kind of fallen in love with this team here in New York is that now, now from the Knicks fans you talk to, I'll, I'll, I'll do the Bill Simmons, like Knicks fans in your life. Do you get the same vibe from them that maybe not necessarily that the playoffs are gravy, but that it's like, you know what, win or lose, I'm just always proud of this team. There's so I might be too plugged into Knicks film school, like mm-hmm. podcast to answer this question, but so the Knicks fans in your life are Robert Cross is what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. Good old Robert, shout out Robert Cross. Uh, my favorite bit is when John just like is reading like the reoccurring like super chatters and he's yep. like, Hey, how you doing? And yeah, it's, that's time this building right there. He plus the KFS. But so independent of that, I do think there's an element of, okay, it's just gravy. But if it's not that, because if it was just gravy, you would be, you wouldn't be living in the moment. Like it feels like Knicks fans are, you'd be talking about, well, how does not having Julius Randall on the court this postseason impact what we do in this next t- team building phase and not having this extensive information of him and OG and Jalen Brunson and the rest of the supporting cast. You're living in the moment because there's expectations. And to that end, some of the Knicks fans I talked to, they're riding these 
absurd emotional roller coasters every game. And we have one mutual friend, your cousin, my friend, Skittles, we'll call him because that's what I'm the only one who calls him that now. It's just like, we'll get a text from him basically every game. And it could be a different reaction where you would think that the Knicks are either down 50 or is like this the game that's going to get them knocked out of playoff content? Like that the stakes, it's like, no, this is April basketball and the Knicks are going to be. So I, the fact that it does feel like fans are so invested not just in this team, but like the outcome of this season matters. We're not just trying to get to that next thing, which is one, it's how coverage a lot of the time works if you're not an A plus title contender. And two, for the Knicks, just the way that they've been set up for so long, like you've always kind of been thinking about that next move, that next thing, that forward thinking aspect. And I don't think, you know, you people were living in the moment, of course, last year, but it feels like even more so that they've grown attached to the idea of like, well, this is the base and this is the team that can accomplish something now. Well, it's also. A large part of it is that, and I, I've I've given this take before, uh, but it really hit home last night. With and it's that the Knicks have played like three different seasons. There's seems the, low. Well, it's so like the season before the the trade of of OG and it for OG Ananobi of RJ Barrett and Manuel quickly. Um, and I guess I also need to include Precious Achua and Malachi Flynn. Precious Achua was like a serviceable rotation member for the Knicks for, and Malachi Flynn scored 50 points in a basketball game. So I got to say they were part of the trade, whether they find their way on NBA teams next year or not. Um, but then there's the, the January version of the team before the Randall injury. And then there's just been every game since like the last 35 games or so. And like last night, the Knicks have this thrilling win. OG and Obi is just outstanding on Giannis in the second half. It's like the proof of concept of how they're going to win playoff games, looking like the second best team in the East. And then scrolling the old Twitter app, um, I I notice a a Knicks. I, I won't say the person or, or the the place. Do but it. One of the, well, no, just like one of the Knicks aggregation sites. And this one I actually think does like a really good job. Uh, comments on Emmanuel Quickly's box score and is like. Uh, we're going to hate uh, Emmanuel Quickly is going to do to us what Jalen Brunson did to Dallas. And it's like, how do you watch what, what Jalen Brunson's done this year and think quickly, not even just think that quickly is going to rise to that, but like not realize Dallas got nothing back. And we just got somebody that shut down Giannis and Ted Kumpo in the yeah. second half last night. Like you like talk about a win-win trade as far as I'm concerned. And we'll see like years from now, what, what the fruits of that are. But the bigger takeaway for me was like, oh, that was this season that they traded Emmanuel quickly. Like I forgot, like, oh my God, that was, that was December 30th. Like we were still like, like the beginning of 2024 was the Knicks trading two franchise favorites that they emotionally invested in, you know? Even the, the Boyo and Alec Burks trade feels like it was forever ago. And I remember being conflicted in the moment because I was like, okay, well you gave up like kind of your, this was before Deuce McBride was what if Steph Curry could win defensive player of the year, basically. So (laughs) in my head, I was like, so you gave away, this made sense. And I thought Bogey, I thought he was a good target for them. And then I was like, he kind of gave up like your last really interesting prospect and you can replenish that pool, but tangible players, young players are always good to have in a trade. But then I got on board with it and I'm watching it for like the first few weeks. Like, oh man, like Tibbs doesn't even want to play these guys and they're not giving him a reason to play him. Now I'm back on like the Boyo train where it's like, look what he's done. He's had a couple like really nice games and he's not even just doing initially. And part of that is new team, whatever. They're just having him kind of fan out space to the corners to create space for Jalen Brunson. Like, no, now he's doing stuff. And that's, that's part of the reason if he has a game like that, where you could feel good, but not good, but it's okay that Julius Randle's not there because he does bring some level not as a passer necessarily and not even maybe following all the way to the basket, but like he just gives you someone who can generate their own shot, which, you know, don't slight precious at you because I have a number. Well, I don't have a number. I'll just ballpark the stat for you. Precious at you ranks second since Julius Randall's injury in the share of his shots going unassisted on the Knicks because there's Jalen Brunson. There's like 80 feet of just nothing. There's this huge gap between him and that's, that is, among the strongest points of his MVP cases, there is no one else on this team right now who maybe they can. You look at Boyan, you look at even Deuce a little bit. Maybe they can. There's no one even coming close to shouldering a number two, number three option level load when it comes to self-creation. Presta Tua ranks second in self-created looks since the Julius Randle injury percentage. That's just, that's wild to me. And look where this team is. Like to bring the discussion back to your overarching point, they might just have the two seed. Like by yeah. when all said and done. Which is the, it's it's why the insanity of this season is just, it's taken its toll 
because you're right. It's probably more like four or five seasons at, at this point. But I don't want to just clarify my manual quickly comments. Like I was a huge believer in quickly. I think he could make an all star team next it year. Win, win, it's, but this isn't right. you said it. It's like they didn't get nothing for him. And the other the other thing that people aren't talking about enough is even if you think Emmanuel quickly ends up being as good as Jalen Brunson, that's fine and it's fair. And like let's not rule it out. But you couldn't have had those two together. Just the way that their their size, the way that we know, I'm not telling fans to care about the cap sheet of their billionaire owners, but it does matter from a team building standpoint. And you're just not, it would not have been the savviest move to have these two guys making because Jalen Brunson's next deal is coming up. So you can't mm-hmm. just pay these guys a combined $80 million and those be like your core it just wouldn't have worked out. It's also not baseball. You actually do need to care about the cap sheet of the billionaire owners because of the second apron and how restrictive it's going to be. I'm just never going to give billionaire owners credit for anything. That's just quite frankly. I agree. No, we, we coast on that, of course. The point being that it would not potentially have been feasible to have both. But I also like, I thought they could have played together. I thought quickly, there was a point this year where I thought quickly could have been starting. But then we yeah. never see what Dante DiVincenzo is as the greatest three point shooter in Knicks history. The, too, you know? the, the context of this team where it was like, like, okay, I know Josh Hart is basically a forward, but like that dude is 6'6. Six, six. Dante DiVincenzo was, what is he, 6'5, six, 6'4? Six, mm-hmm. And so, like, you need these actual wing size players, which OG Ananobi is. And the thing, I don't want to say I got it wrong because I do think there was a level, and I'm not, this is not a criticism of Nick's fandom. It's a, actually a compliment. He comes to New York and he's doing basically everything he did in Toronto. There was definitely, he was better defensively. Like, he looked more engaged, but it gets, look at, wow, he's moving off the ball. And it's, but so he did that stuff. But my point was, I didn't realize how much going from, even if you want to say it was getting rid of RJ, removing that ball dominance from the equation to someone who is more of just this complementary fit on offense than needing to be a central focus. I didn't even realize the impact that was going to have on the offense. And we're still dealing with small samples there, but it's when OG Ananobi was on before his elbow injury, they, they looked we like they looked unstoppable aside like non Celtics, non nuggets division. They just looked like they were going to run things. This is how delusional I got. I wanted like the, the last, the second to last game before both the elbow before Ananobi left the lineup and before Randall dislocated his shoulder uh, was against the nuggets and they won by like 35 points at the garden. And it was like, Oh, all right, what's this? The, I don't know. He looks like looks like Kawhi Leonard hit twenty six points on like twelve shots and had like this mid mid range game. And it was like, oh, he like spun and fade away. I remember. I think I remember like the exact moment. He, oh my god! <laughs> it very much was like I, I. I. What is this now? Okay, so I just I wanted to see what it looked like against the Celtics, and we were probably never going to get it. At least not this season. Uh, Oh, well, again, who knows if they make the conference finals, if we see what the non Julius version of that team looks like. Look, I think we my my position that day was that I was curious because I was very high in Emmanuel quickly. I still think quickly is going to be like a fine, serviceable, but all star ceiling point guard. Uh, Jalen Brunson for me is in the MVP conversation, which I personally don't think Emmanuel quickly will ever enter as high my, as my projections may be like Jalen Brunson's fourth in scoring this he, year. He's just averaging more points per game uh, than Kevin Durant, than Devin Booker, than Jason Tatum, like some of the best scorers in the sport. It's, it's Giannis, it's SGA and it's Luca. That's it. That are averaging more points per game than Jalen Brunson. And that's why when you turn the keys over to him and put the perfect fit around him, you can you commend the team for making what is you know a, a, a cold hearted decision to the extent of that your fan base loved the two guys that you traded out, but it ended up making your team better at least in the short term. You know, yeah, and it, I mean, no one should take that as a slight to say I don't think Emmanuel Cook is going to enter the MVP discussion because it would have been a reasonable take to say I don't think after the season he had last year, I don't think Jalen I didn't have Jalen Brunson like in my MVP consideration mm-hmm. heading into the preseason. It was just like, I think he's a great player. He could contend for all NBA. I didn't think he was going to be the, like near the top of the MVP ballot. So if anyone's upset like over that relative to Emmanuel quickly, that's just... <laughs> you know, we're both doing... We're both playing out the take cycle. We're both like, oh my gosh, they hate Emmanuel quickly. How dare them? I'm never listening to... No, we both like quickly, but Brunson's he, been awesome. He looks and- more, or he, ha- he has... I like. I think he just returned to the team, but like before he was missing time for personal reasons, he looked more like a lead guard than I'd ever seen before. And part of that is just opportunity. The Knicks never 
really needed him, especially since Jalen Brunson was there. They didn't need him to be a lead guard. So he's going to be a fantastic player. Jalen Brunson is, I don't know if this is where you want to go next, but Jalen Brunson's going to finish probably no lower than seventh on the MVP ballot. And he ended up, we actually just, we did did our official MVP ballots over at Hardwood Knox. He finished fifth. Sure. Okay, mod. so you finished fifth on yours. What's, My reaction so what's was after five? watching what's the five? past two Bucks games, just kind of like, does he need to, does he need to be above Giannis? Because I have Luca three, SGA two, and but it's just like you finish in the top five of the MVP ballot. That stuff doesn't happen on accident, even if it's only once. It just it doesn't. And so his season has been. I sent you a stat the other day, where I I tend to like harp on these things that other people might not care about. You look at the defensive coverage he faced. And I would be willing to predict that there have been maybe three players, maybe, that have faced more double teams, blitzes, whatever, this season than he has. His turnover rate is still so freaking low. And then there's discourse, well, is he like really an A-level passer? Who fuck cares? He hasn't turned the ball over. <laughs> and he's still going to get the assists. And I don't even remember what the number was. I think it was, there, there are two players in NBA history now to have multiple seasons averaging 24 plus points and six assists with a turnover rate below 10. It's Jalen Brunson and Michael Jordan. And that's like, even by cherry picking standards, that's freaking wild. So yeah. he is, I'm very interested to see if he winds up getting where he ends up on the, the MVP ballot overall, just because I think I would be, I understand the case for Tatum. I understand, I think before the Clippers kind of like started crapping the bed, like I, I got the Kawhi stuff, but it's like, I, I have a very hard time coming up with a reason for why he shouldn't be like, uh, for me, I put him fifth. I want to make that clear. But like, if he's sixth or seventh, I get it. If he's he's going to be off people's MVP ballots, and I really want him, I'm going to need them to explain why, if and when they do that. So for the longest time, I had him sixth, and I think even earlier this week, I had him sixth. And I, like, what a difference a week makes that like, because the the people he's passing in my again, I'm a mellow guy, so him passing mellow for most 30 point games in a season and like, well, sixth most 30 point games in a season. Now he's tied with Bob McAdoo and like he passed mellow for 40 point games in a season. So you add in like the assist numbers are astronomical compared to where mellow ever was. The efficiency uh, is different from where mellow was partially because mellow grew up in an era where the Kobe long two and the Jordan long two, uh, was was glorified, and well, even, then even Brunson that, takes a couple steps back. That's what I was going to say. Is like that's kind of even a testament, maybe not to his MVP campaign, but this the, the efficiency has trailed off here specifically. But this is someone who in Dallas, I know he's playing with Luca, but it wasn't. We signed Jalen Brunson because we know he's going to be one of the best off the bounce three point shooters in the NBA. That was just never something he projected as. And then he comes to New York, and this season specifically, that's what he was for most of this year, and it's still become like a very I don't want to say bankable, but like dependable part of his arsenal. It's like that's something that he's leveled up to as well. Yeah. He's also still in the 81st percentile of points per, per shot attempt. And I think the biggest thing, and this is not something you could have said last year, like quickly was the plus minus God. And like then Josh Hart came, like OG Anobi is like far exceeded the plus minus. Like he was breaking deity. records every. I felt like after every game he played, it was for a player in his first X games with a new team. OG Ananobi had the top plus minus. In that those game. first twelve, those first fourteen games need its own documentary. Where how good the Knicks were. That's just <laughs> it ends with Randall ter- dislocating his shoulder. Um, but Brunson is out plus thirteen in on off this year, which like he was around like plus four or five. No, now like the non Brunson minutes were always. Like the the bugaboo up until last night, uh, I think Tibbs fine. God bless Tibbs. He's been searching for combinations that are like, okay, maybe this will work. Maybe this will work. Now the funny thing is, I wonder if the non Brunson minutes should just be called. And shout out to Jeremy. I think he made this joke. Um, the the non Brunson minutes should just be called the the Alec Burks minutes because now we're getting non Alec Burks minutes and the Knicks are positive all of a sudden. What do you know? Um, so you have Jokic one. I'm assuming. Yeah, I do have I do have Jokic one. So you have this Jokic like, one, SGA two, Luca three, Tatum four, Brunson five. So you have Giannis, Giannis off. I had Giannis four, Brunson five, Tatum. So Tatum six. off completely. You know what's interesting? The I don't want to get into, but people will use this as well. Brunson's not a better player than Tatum, and I don't, I don't even care. I don't want to explain where you land on that subject. To me, I try to differentiate if we're talking about an All NBA discussion versus like an MVP ball, or just ranking players, maybe versus the MVP ballot, like it's just different because like there's that, yes, it's ambiguous because the NBA doesn't have criteria for value. If you want to go best player on the best team, then yes, it's just Tatum. 
whether you want to put him first or above Brunson, but like there's that ambiguous interpretation of value, which is Jalen Brunson is so indispensable to his team. And it's not a team that was built necessarily for him to be. This is indispensable. It has been a confluence of factors beyond his control that has led the Knicks to be this dependent on him. And this is what he's doing. And so that would be my argument for, even if you, if someone wants to put him ahead of Giannis, it's not criticizing Tatum for having better teammates necessarily. If you were to rank to say, well, like Jason Tatum doesn't average as many assists as Jalen Brunson or something, it's like, okay, well now you need to get into the different context of their roles. But when you're talking about value specifically, like that's like, it's just so different and people boil it down. They don't want it to be different, I guess, because they don't want to have the multi-layered discussion about it. So I believe the only team to have to win 60 games and not have someone finish top five in MVP. So that, that Al, that Al Horford, uh, Hawks team that won 60. And we all just kind of looked up. It's like, really? The Hawks are going to win 60. And, and then, then they ran into the truck like, in the playoffs. Yeah. First round. We we're like, can the Nets beat them? And then it was like, well, maybe the, the wizards are going to beat them. And then the LeBron showed up. I was like, all right, don't worry. We got this. Like the, the and that was a, a very quick sweep. Um, but like, that's why the Celtics team is such a juggernaut and it just, it feels wrong for me personally to like ignore the history of winning 60 games. I do think Brunson's been better than Tatum this year, but it's almost like on principle, I feel like I have to honor history because of how much I appreciate that stat, which is or that precedent. I should say that precedent. Right. Uh, Yeah. I mean, I get that. I would just almost argue that it's like, (sighs) I don't, I mean, I made the case on the podcast. They can go check it out. It was just oh, like, so there has, it is. Yeah. go check out the, the yeah, has, Hardwood Nice podcast. Has Tatum been more value added more value to the Celtics than Jalen Brunson has added to the Knicks this year? And it's just no. circumstances are just a part of that. You can't, no, I don't want to penalize Tatum for having Jalen Brown and Derek White and Christoph Porzingis having one of the best, the second best, if not the best season of his career. You're not penalizing him for that. But if the question is who has added more value to their team, the answer is Jalen Brunson. Now, if you want to get into who's the better player, I do think that's more of an all NBA type of discussion to where it's, we haven't done our all NBA picks yet. I might have Tatum on all NBA first team and Brunson will be on second team just because it, I don't think it needs to mirror your MVP ballot necessarily. So then I think if you wanted to, you could actually make a case Brunson is ahead of Giannis. Um, especially if the Knicks end up a two seed with this roster, uh, and then so Brunson should be fourth, Giannis fifth. Can I can I make the Luca second argument and and for, for you over I SGA? I, I honestly, yeah, and you can and very very quickly, I'll just say I have Jokic kind of by like a very wide margin. And then I think you could probably order whoever you wanted after that. And I'm just one, they're not gonna win. So of course I'm not gonna push back. But I, I think that there are probably five or six guys that all have credible top three, top four type cases. Yeah. I think my ballot right now would be Jokic one, Luka two. And then in some, well, no, not in some order SGA. I'll go Brunson Giannis. Cause again, ignoring the precedent of 60 win teams, especially one with an 11 net rating, um, probably should have an MVP, uh, MVP candidate on it. Um, uh, maybe like you said, in this new world of positionless NBA, the top 15 players can potentially you, you put Tatum over over Brunson if you want to in in that and that's the consolation prize that a, a snapshot of this year is a Celtic finish top five and honestly just given how weird of a defensive stop start Giannis specifically not because the Bucks are still dealing with some defensive concerns given how weird his start was there is if you want to like it might be easier at this point in the MVP ballot to make the case for Jason Tatum over Giannis and Tentacupo than it is for Jason Tatum over Jalen Brunson that might be again mm. I didn't I felt a little queasy like you did leaving Tatum off but you also don't want to you know, if it's what you feel, if it's what you believe, like after just watching all these games, looking at numbers and like thinking about it, it's, you don't want to shy away from it. And it's, I don't think it's egregious to have Jalen. And first of all, the difference between sixth and fifth on the MVP ballot is just like, right, right. It's not that big, especially since it's going to be like a distant, we're all not, we're, they're all losing the Jokic. Like it doesn't matter where you put it. care about who didn't win when there's an actual debate over who should win. And I think at this point, which is a testament to Jokic is that he's kind of just the Embiid injury, open that up for him. And then just like even Shea with his injury and then kind of the way he was playing a little bit, Jokic has kind of just like flipped it on his head to where, no, it's just, it's just him. And so people almost, 
if they want to argue about who finishes second, that's fine. That player still isn't going to win. So the funny part is like, and you voted for, well, voted. You you put, I remember your ballot. You and Grant both had Jokic as your MVP last year. And I think there's a hint of like once Embiid went out this year, like the, the conversation, oh, okay, so we're just going to give the one that a lot of people feel that they owe to Jokic. They're just going to give him that one. And like, I'm someone that said it was Embiid last year and kind of maintains that that was a regular season award. And then Jokic turned into something, something different in the playoffs. Maybe not something significantly different, but I thought he took a leap in the playoffs to win his first ring. I think um, his leap was, wow, my team around me is healthy. That was the leap. That was, but they were 20 and 17 over their last 37 games. Yeah. Like they coasted and then come playoff time, which is a fair playing argument. 40 minutes. You know? a, that's, a, that's a perfectly reasonable. And look, they're kind of in that mode again. Like they are just, they know who they, and like, which is funny because they actually have something to play for now. They're like, they're trying to get the one seed, you know? So yeah, I, I think it was reasonable for, but like that was an actual debate last year. Do you think that, would you be prepared to make a case for Luca or SGA no. or Giannis over Jokic? I thought right there was now? an SGA case for the longest time. These last seven games that SGA's only played one and it was the game winner against the Knicks. And I'm watching these people, these other teams that are competing with the Knicks for playoff positioning, not have to face SGA on the schedule. It's like, oh, so you you didn't run from the grind when it came to New York City, but then the rest of the, the season, you just kind of sat out. Got it. So when you drop to a three seed, congratulations. You also dropped to third in MVP voting. I will say what turned it for me is, and I'm sure you saw, so they just came out of the All-Star break and there was this big story because we know Jokic isn't like this huge talker that he he texted the team coming out of the all-star break. And I don't know what he said, but it was to the effect of let's go F and get this or something. And then the Nuggets uh, like that started steamrolling everybody. And then on top, like, so it was even before SGA kind of faded or, or got injured. It was just like, no, this is not. And then during that time, what they also did is the units that Jokic was carrying independent of the starting lineup got more bench heavy. It's just like, Oh, they're going to win those minutes anyway. Because I, I, I personally think he's the single greatest optimizer of talent around him in the league right now and that it's not particularly close and that you could talk about Luca. I mean, LeBron is still there, but it's just like Jokic is, it doesn't matter who you have around him on offense. It's just like, he's going to get the most out of those guys and optimize them. My actual serious answer for, for SGA dropping the three is what Luca has been the last like 25 games. I thought there was a, especially an EPM case. I didn't realize um, maybe until like 20, 20 or so games ago that like Embiid went out and SGA then s stepped in for eligible players for EPM. Like he's still number one in EPM this year. Whatever you credence you put into that, like he's still like the, toward the top in defensive EPM, toward the top in offensive EPM, like a very well-rounded player. Uh, that is a very young team ahead of schedule that's going to win like 55, 56 games. There's a case to give him the MVP and then you watch the Nuggets and like, I, I, I forget how much of a baseball fan you are, but there's a the act, funny, funny comp. The Colorado baseball team, the Rockies, plays at Coors Field and it's notorious for like because of the altitude, the ball carries. And so there's always like, oh, those are your numbers, but those are your numbers at Coors Field. Like it's always elevated how good offensive players are. And then they go on the road and like their splits are different. Playing with Jokic is like playing at Coors Field. Like your numbers are just going to look different. Like I don't know what Jamal Murray is if he's independent of Jokic. I don't know what anybody is independent of Jokic. <laughs> like any anybody you want to say, oh Michael Porter Jr. I'd put him. So Giancarlo from Miami uh, was like, um, would you trade Julius Randle for Aaron Gordon? It's like I'm not trading for anybody that's been with Jokic. I just I don't trust those Coors Field numbers and whether or not you know, independent of that factor is the perfect example too, because we have this sample of him being with this other team that tried to do so many different things with him and make him this mm -hmm. future op option. He goes into Denver and kudos to him with the, the defensive workload that he shoulders playing more five now, but you put him in a different role and it's because of Jokic. And yes, you have other shot creators like a Jamal Murray. So that helps, but Jokic allows you to exist in this role to the point where you just want to inextricably tie their minutes together for so long. And now it's like, well, we need him to play the five. So you can't necessarily do that. But yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a great way to frame it. It's like pl yeah. playing with Jokic, like playing in course field. I like that. And then you just, just one clean in the glass search for on off. And it's like, Oh, he's still a plus 23. Which, like if we can circle back to the Knicks on that. Jalen Brunson, uh, no minutes filters anymore. 
just has the second biggest offensive uh, rating swing in the entire league behind Nikola Jokic. Yeah. And so it's like, that is mind boggling. Yeah. That is just. It's, it's, it's why, like, I. I, I was getting to, well, not getting into it. I was admiring Schwinn like so adamantly. Shout out to Schwinny Poo over at the Strickland that like he was like Brunson's top five for MVP. Like that should, that's the conversation. And, and like there's never a, like an actual conversation to be had. He's like, no, he's top five in MVP. And then he'll, he'll probably, he'll probably snap back at you if you say differently. And then you just go through it. He's averaging more. Like the Tatum, I think, is the one that you go to if you want to make a case because he's averaging more points per game, averaging a higher three point percentage, higher field goal percentage, a higher free throw percentage, like higher EPM, higher advanced, this higher advanced that and higher on off. And it's like, so he's had a better season this year. (laughs) Yeah. It's, I wish I'm conditioned to equivocate on anything that I believe or just in general. And so I would never be able to sit up. If you don't have Jalen Brunson top five on your MVP ballot, I'm not, I want to, I would love to hear like the case and I'll listen to it. You might even convince me mm-hmm. at that point. So I wish I had that level of either self-belief or confidence to say, no, he's just top five and it's, where's he going to finish inside the top five? There's really only one, two. I mean, there's, there's really one player I feel that strongly about in the MVP discussion. It is Jokic. But I, what I will think is interesting is that there might just be people who think that Jalen Brunson's MVP cases, the Knicks were banged up he carried them to respectability. It's like, no, this is not. And it's fine if that is the MVP case where this roster would be terrible without him and he brings them to above average respectability. But it's when you look and dig into the numbers of what he's doing, it's the Knicks profile as a contender with him and a lottery team without him. And so so to have that be the gap of mid injuries, like be so like that sample size is, is so huge. That feels like, you can't necessarily dismiss that. And so like, that's why he ends up at five. But again, I'm conditioned to equivocate. And so I can't just sit here and say, if he doesn't finish in top five, I'm going to be, I was listening to the post game pod after the Bucks game. I got through the first two p- parts and it was just, I wish I could even, and I know Macri wasn't like digging into it. He was doing it off the cuff. Where it was just like, well, I'm going to leave Tatum to the side. I'm leaving Devin Booker to the side. Is Jalen yeah. better than them? Just kind of like, you could just, I wish I was able to do something like that. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I look after a post game. That's when. That's when. That's the time to to be reckless and irrational. That just. I think the coolest part about it is, I don't know how reckless and irrational it is anymore. That's how good he's been this season. It's kind of if you wanted to look forward, and this might have changed a while ago. But when everyone's talking about the Knicks getting that next player, like you've reached the point where it's that next player is not who you think it needs to be. Mm-hmm. For so long, it was this player needs to be, I say for so long, and Jalen Brunson hasn't even played two seasons in New York, but it was this player needs to be better, at least as good as Jalen Brunson. And like now we're just progressively like, I mean, if your second best player was OG Ananobi on this team, like maybe the Knicks could win the title or something. That might be an extreme, but it's, you can now, he has shifted the entire way that you view the immediacy and long-term outlook of this team. Like he has just unlocked so much by making this leap immediately. And again, when you're trying to, because if you're sitting here and and if you believe that the Knicks are going to win the title next year, I love you. I hope it, I hope it comes (laughs) to fruition. But like when you're trying to just project forward, it's their paths to get there. They might be more ambiguous than ever, but there's more optionality than ever now because of Jalen Brunson. I would pick the Knicks to be my two seed next year. Like just a lot of that is dependent on a healthy Ananobi. And I think that who always just has something. If you go through his injury history, he's, he might have been every single body part. And it's like never anything like Randall dislocated shoulder. That is a very clear cause and effect. Oh, you fell, you dislocated your shoulder. You're out for the year. Ananobi. It's like, I woke up. My elbow was sore. Oh, there's bone spurs. I'm going to, I'm going to get a know, he went to pump gas, ripped his cornea, something like right, that. Yeah. But it, but it's like not not even a rip. It's like a scratch. It's like, all right, so I'm going to be yeah, out for 17 there, yeah. games because I, I can kind of not see. And it's I'm not even like making a commentary on like whether he's soft because I know Nick's Twitter is listening and they like to be disrespectful in that sense. But like it's just you have to f- factor in to your OG Ananobi calculations that you're going to miss like 20 or so games. So you're almost wondering if like say he's a he's a 56 game player that's 26 games you have to factor without him so go 13 and 13 in that and your win margin is whatever the games you have OG had an OB for because that's how good of a Swiss army knife which is, is you know 
12, 14, 15 for any indication, that's fine. That's fine. <laughs> like, well, so like if they're going to at this win percentage and in those 56 games go like 50 and six, then yeah, I'll, I'll be okay. If they go, if they go 13 and 13, cause that's 63 wins uh, without, with Ananobi. Look, I, I don't know what your thoughts are for like, the OG Anobi contract that's about to come. I'm still at like what he wants is what I would want to pay. <laughs> <OG Anobi. laughs> Personally, Look, the market is whatever someone is willing to pay him. That's not the Knicks. I do think that there would be, I, I think there are multiple teams that would hand him the four year max. And if that's what he ends up getting from the Knicks, or if it's a five year deal and it's a little, that's what he is worth. And it's, it's interesting how, not even discussions, but entire perspectives shift of players once they get raises. But think about think about Tyler Hero, regardless of where you land on the Tyler Hero spectrum. Like this, oh, look at what the Heat found. Then he gets the contract he does is like, oh, like, oh, he's not worth anything in a trade. That's a terrible contract. You know who's gonna it's gonna happen to next is Tyrese Maxey, because he's about to get his max deal. And the Knicks are in this weird spot where it it's not going to happen to Deuce McBride because he's making zero dollars. I think he's actually mm-hmm. paying to play on the Knicks right now. <laughs> but like Jalen Brunson is going to get a next contract soon. What is the discourse going to be like around him? Isaiah Hartenstein? What if it takes full early bird rights to keep him? And my God, I hope the Knicks keep him. Yeah. Uh, I mean, whatever. I don't, I'm don't. i totally detached from the situation. I don't care. Yeah, where I know. Goes, but, yeah, yeah. Uh, but like, what is that going to look like when he's all of a sudden getting paid that much more money? So it's just, is that same thing going to happen with OG Ananobi? It kind of already happened to where it's like, that's why the Raptors had to prioritize actual players over picks. His teams didn't want to give up all this first round picks because of his next deal. So I always find it interesting how it's like, and like, will it happen to Josh Hart next year because his extension kicks in a little bit? So, but it's, just, it's that was really, I didn't make a point there other than I, I find it fascinating, verging on sometimes detrimental to how we view players after they get these raises. I mean, <sighs> Not my money for the billionaire owners to have to pay. But I that comes with it. But this version of OG Ananobi, if he's healthy, which is the caveat with literally every single other player, is going to be worth whatever the Knicks have to pay him. And you that's not true for every team because some teams aren't good enough to pay your third or fourth best player. That or let's I'll say it this way: your third or fourth most important offensive player, maybe even your fifth most offensive player, but third or fourth most offensive player, you're not in a position. And the Knicks for so long. That's why, to me, I thought they made a smart decision not to trade for Donovan Mitchell. You weren't good enough to give up that much to get Donovan Mitchell as your best player. The Knicks are now good enough to pay OG Ananobi that much money to be their third or fourth most important player. And I'm just assuming that you eventually need someone, whether it's Julius Randle, whether it's someone else who is your second most player overall, because second best, second most important player overall because of the offense. Well, so what's funny is, and I need Jeremy Cohen to be right about this, but he can just opt in and extend, which would do the Knicks a favor and would also would also help his friends at CAA, potentially, uh, that the Knicks may have a relationship with, the, the fine folks over the creative arts agency. He's pull the Josh Hart is what you're saying. Uh, That's literally what Josh Hart did. I mean, the, the whispers, according to Steve Popper, that Jalen Brunson's willing to talk extension this summer which would be off this this low market deal that he'd be extending off of this number, which obviously you get the full max, but it's not the super duper max that he could get if he just goes to free agency in two years, you know? Yeah, I mean, if they are able to, what is it, 140% now extend off that number, you just, you have to do it because like, of what, like, why wouldn't you do it? Because there's yeah. cost you more to retain him and you'll have to sign it. Teams don't, I feel like teams don't look at, or fans maybe don't look at this nearly enough too, is like you let them, if you let the contract expire and you are worried about the price point, when you're extending, especially when there's like these extra years attached, where in Jalen Brunson's case, there could be two that he has left, you are repressing the the length of the deal and then by extension, the full, full on cost. And so the Knicks, I mean, he's going to have, he might have a top five finish on the MVP ballot. If he's going to willing to sign that extension, you have to. I mean, I might question what is going on with Jalen Brunson that he wants to sign this extension, but Just loyalty. That's all. There's there's nothing going on with him or his agency or who his agent agent. But I don't, how dare you question the character of the New York Knicks and their potential ties to CAA? Uh, Dan, I mean, Dan, Dan, even Valley. if there well, yeah, and if there was something sinister there, uh, they'll stomach the second round pick gladly or whatever they're uh, getting. Allegedly for. sinister, sir. Now, Mark Cuban's claims were not proven in a court of law. It was just Adam Silver decided uh, through his 
investigation that they're it's like the the, the flake game more probable than not is what we'll call it probably one of my worst takes by the way just to own I, and it's funny because i have all these nick's twitter accounts and i'm just mm-hmm. not on twitter as much anymore because uh elon sucks and ruined it but mm-hmm. uh they were pulling up some of my reactions to the jail and brunson thing where my take wasn't the money it was you went through all this to get the ec- whatever i thought the best player was in the nba but i said what well, what was the thing that you just said that made me think of one of my worst takes was more probable than not. Oh, oh, oh it was, you went through all this to tamper and get Jalen Brunson. And I was mm-hmm. like, Oh, you watched uh, the Denver tamper to get Deandre Jordan. So that became funny, but it's like that take of mine aged like milk, which is like, Oh, you went through all this just to get Jalen Brunson, who at the time mm-hmm. was like, maybe felt like the 40th best player in the NBA. So that's a terrible take. But, uh, and that was put to shame pretty quickly because the nuggets, Somehow, somehow miraculously agreed to a deal with DeAndre Jordan one minute after free agency started. Yeah. Yeah. Well, look, like not to look, I'd love to pile on that take of yours about Jalen Brunson. He, I was optimistic. He could be an all-star. Like I, I basically had quickly expectations for him and we just did 20 minutes on why he should be in the MVP conversation ahead of Jason Tatum or he, maybe potentially honest. Like I will say, justifiably I think, so, you know, I will say based off what he's done from what I've seen in double teams, the element of the kind of, it feels like adding a level to his scoring arsenal, the level of self-creation that he's had to take on this year. And then even just, we know that he might be targeted on defense, but the guy works on defense. He will finish on the back end for people who do like ultra deep, most improved player ballots. Um, he might even finish in the top three or five of some people's MIP ballots. And so that's just like, it's he's just having one of those seasons, man, where it's, you're talking about him in the MVP discussion, but he might get some MIP love too.